Hello, I'm Nick, and this is Today in Philosophy of History from Monday, 8 January 2024, and it is the 119th anniversary of the birth of Carl Gustav Hempel, known to his friends as Peter, who was born in Oranienburg, Germany, on this date in 1905. Hempel is best known as a philosopher of science in the logical empiricist tradition. He wasn't actually part of the Vienna Circle, but he was known, he was part of what is, came to be known as the Berlin Circle, met Carnap in 1929, and eventually became Carnap's assistant in Chicago. So we can see how much he is embedded in that tradition. And he's also responsible for uh, the Paradox of the Ravens, which is a well-known paradox of induction that philosophers of science continue to debate to this day. So he's had a very significant influence in the philosophy of science. He also brought that philosophy of science background to philosophy of history. And so in that sense, we could call him an analytical philosopher of history. And when I made a video on Arthur Danto, I said that he pretty much defined analytical philosophy of history. But that was after... Hempel had uh, laid the groundwork and done it in a little different way. Uh, Danto's philosophy of history was based around the logic of narrative sentences. And Hempel's analytical philosophy of history was much closer to just an application of analytical philosophy or logical positivism to problems in the logic of history. And he almost, you could say, straddles the divide between what has come to be called the distinction between analytical and substantive philosophy of history that I discussed in relation to Danto. So he was using all the tools of analytic philosophy of history and working in the tradition of logical positivism, but he addresses the age-old question of whether there are laws of history, which is conventionally a substantive inquiry in the philosophy of history, not merely an analytical uh, inquiry. In uh, a 2018 paper, Fons de Wolf, uh, the paper is titled Revi Revisiting Hempel's 1942 Contribution to the Philosophy of History, he quotes the well-known Renaissance historian Paul Oscar Christeller as saying of host, um, saying of, 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 of Hempel, quote, well, he wasn't directly talking about Hempel, but clearly this is the implication here. Quote, philosophers who claim to explore the status of historical knowledge have written about general laws of history and about causal explanation. These topics may concern the philosophy of history and also the sociologist and anthropologist, but they are speculative and derivative and at best marginal for the practicing historian or philologist, unquote. So that actually sounds a lot like Danto when he said that speculative philosophy of history or substantive philosophy of history or material philosophy of history, whatever you want to call it, isn't really philosophy and isn't really history. Basically, it's an orphan under this scheme. But as I said, Hempel kind of uh, straddles that divide, as do other. I would I would suggest that R.G. Collingwood also straddles that divide. It becomes very difficult to say with idealist philosophers of history whether they are supposed to be analytic or substantive. So uh, Hempel's contribution to the philosophy of history is primarily in the form of three papers. So no big book, no treatise, but the 1942 paper, The Function of General Laws in History, the 1962 paper, Explanation in History, in Explanation in Science and History, and the 1963 paper, Reasons and Covering Laws in Historical Explanation. Lewis Mink wrote of uh, Hempel, quote, almost all of the philosophical literature on philosophy of history in the last decade has dealt with the logic of explanation. The locus classicus is, of course, C.G. Hempel, unquote. Hempel's work greatly stimulated investigations into what historical explanation is. And previous philosophers of history who hadn't said much about this 
found themselves in rejecting Hempel's position, if they did re reject Hempel's position, they had to give their own account of historical explanation. So it became a big issue after Hempel to, to discuss historical explanation, even if even among those who didn't agree with Hempel and wanted to give their own account of what constitutes an historical explanation. So Hempel's account of philosophy of history was very much derived from his uh, understanding of empirical science. As we saw, he was a philosopher of science, and he brought that to philosophy of history. And insofar as he brought the analysis of natural science from logical empiricism into philosophy of history, he stands against the tradition that's defined by, for example, Wilhelm Dilthey, Wilhelm Winterband, and Heinrich Rickert, who all argued that History may be a science, but it's not a science in the way that the natural sciences are sciences. That is to say, there's more than one scientific method, and the natural sciences are nomothetic, and the uh, and the social sciences or Geisteswissenschaften, uh, as the Germans would say, were were um, ideographic, and that means the the law-like versus the particularistic, which is originally formulated uh, in by Wilhelm Wildeband and greatly elaborated by many others since then. And implicit in the above quote from Christeller when he was rejecting these scientific methods in history and calling for a distinct method. So Hempel held that the methods of science were applicable in history. And so then implicitly the methods of philosophy of science could then be applied to become a philosophy of history. And he is particularly associated with what has come to be called the covering law model. And where you have uh, the explanandum, which is the thing that you're explaining, is explained by the explanands, which are the things doing the explaining. And the explanands consists of a, a law plus whatever else you have to add of particular circumstances to describe the thing that is being uh, uh, analyzed in terms of the law. And that is your historical explanation. Hempel focused on what he called deductive nomological explanation, uh, but this is a special case of the covering law model. He, Hempel also discussed probabilistic statistical explanations. They both have the same logical structure. So it's not that the, sec the probabilistic statistical is an inductive argument. It uses an inductive argument as a premise, but the, it's the same logical structure as a normal deductive nomological explanation, which uses a deductive premise to derive a conclusion, an exp a, a historical explanation from a law and propositions asserting particular circumstances in which the law plays out. So Hempel's 1942 paper lays out his program in this way, quote, it is a rather wildly, excuse me, it is a rather widely held opinion that history in contradistinction, contradistinction to the so-called physical sciences is concerned with the description of particular events of the past rather than with the search for general laws which might gov govern these events. As a characterization of the type of problem in which some historians are mainly interested, this view probably cannot be denied. As a statement of the theoretical function of the general laws in scientific historical research, it is certainly unacceptable. The following considerations are an attempt to substantiate this point by showing in some detail that the general laws have quite analogous functions in history and in the natural sciences, that they form an indispensable instrument of historical research, and they, are e and they even constitute the common basis of various procedures, which are often considered as characteristic of the, so of the social in contradistinction to the natural sciences." Unquote. So one, you, one thing you could take away from this quote is that Hempel saying, yes, the traditional, traditionally historical history has been ideographic, but the nomothetic portion, the law-like portion using the covering law model, according to Hempel, is engaged in, it's a necessary part of historical research. You could say he's proposing that there could be more than one history. There can be a traditional history, but then we still need to develop this new conception of history 
in which we use the techniques of scientific demonstration. This is not how, however, how uh, Hempel was interpreted. Uh, he basically, he was interpreted as saying, you know, he, nobody said this explicitly, but historians have been wrong. Those who have opposed the use of scientific method in history have been wrong. We need to change history. It needs to come in line with, with explanations in terms of the covering law model. In his exposition of historical explanation, he often wrote about how historical explanations can be incomplete. And here is a quote from his 1962 explanation in Science and History that makes a point. Quote, explanations put forward in everyday discourse and also in scientific contexts are often elliptically formulated. When we explain, for example, that a lump of butter melted because it was put into a hot frying pan, or that a small rainbow appeared in the spray of the lawn sprinkler because the sunlight was reflect reflected and refracted by the water droplets, we may be said to offer elliptic formulations of deductive nomological explanations. An account of this kind omits mention of certain laws or particular facts, which it tacitly takes for granted and whose explicit citation would yield a complete deductive nomological argument, unquote. So many historical explanations are incomplete. And the other terminology, Husserl, excuse me, Hempel uses uh, besides elliptically formulated is that historians aren't actually giving explanations. They are giving a sketch of explanation or an explanation sketch. And he writes about this in his 1942 paper, as I cited earlier, quote, what the explanatory analysis of historical events offers is then, in most cases, not an explanation in one of the meanings developed above, but something that might be called an explanation sketch. Such a sketch consists of more or less vague indication of the laws and initial conditions con considered as relevant, and it needs filling out in order to turn it into a full-fledged explanation. This filling out requires further empirical research for which the sketch suggests the direction." Unquote. So this idea is not at all new. The idea that historians leave out a lot or leave out more than they put in has been the basis of historical skepticism for a long time. Uh, in fact, Descartes, who was not only a skeptic of his own existence, but also a skeptic of history, wrote in his Discourse on Method, quote, fables make us conceive of events as being possible where they are not, even if the most faith faithful accounts of the past neither alter nor exaggerate the importance of things in order to make them more attractive to the reader, they nearly always leave out the humblest and least illustrative historical circumstances with the result that what remains does not appear as it really was, and that those who base their behavior on the examples they draw from such accounts are likely to try to match the feats of knights of old in tales of chivalry and set themselves targets beyond their own powers, unquote. I have to wonder if Cervantes had read this uh, before he read, wrote Don Quixote, because uh, trying to equal the feats of knights of old certainly sounds like Don Quixote. In any case, it has long been a criticism of history that historians have to engage in selection. But do we really want a complete history? Could we have a complete history? And what would be a complete history? We remember in, when I talked about Danto, he invoked as a thought experiment what he called the ideal chronicler that would take a record of absolutely everything that happened. But he de determined by his basis, on the basis of the way narrative sentences are formulated, that this ideal chronicle, even if it was complete, even if it was exhaustive, it would not be a history because there would be no sentences in narrative form. It would just be an account of what happens as it happens. So the ideal chronicle might be complete and exhaustive, but it's not a history at least according to Danto. And I think a lot of people would agree that, that a chronicle is not, not a history. So what is 
what would a complete history be? You know, obviously no one would read a complete history because it would be full of the exhaustive details of ordinary life. No one could write it because it would be essentially, essentially infinitistic because you could never exhaust all the detail. So it's, it's like, it's a straw man in a sense, because there couldn't really be a complete history. Now, maybe, maybe there is a way there could be a complete history. That would be an interesting question to investigate. But according to what we think of as history now, history is you know written in terms of narrative sentences. It's not going to include all the things that just Descartes was skeptical of. And it's probably not going to include a lot of what Hempel was saying that are ex excluded from elliptical accounts and only sketched in a historical explanation in a traditional historian. Be that as it may, there are, of course, problems with the covering law model. I, that's what philosophers do, is they find problems in other people's arguments. One of the arguments that have been made is that the generalizations used in explanations are not necessarily laws. Uh, some of them are you know, very, very limited in scope, but they're, they're still a rule. If we take, for example, what Napoleon is supposed to have said, that God is on the side of the larger battalions, is that a law or is that just a generalization with lots of exceptions and qualifications? It would clearly seem that that's a, a generalization. And if that is the matter from which you're deriving your historical narrative, your, your explanations and your arguments, then you're not really using a covering law and you're not really embedding historical argument and historical explanation within a fully scientific context. Now, there's a lot of, there, there's arguments on both sides, of course. Like I said, this is what philosophers do. They find problems on other people's uh, argument. And given that Hempel was a philosopher of science, he was very much embedded in this tradition, the proper attitude to take to Hempel is not, oh, we found a problem with the covering law model, therefore Hempel is wrong. Hempel would have been completely in favor of find another explanatory model, find another version of science that applies, a, a formulation of scientific method that applies to both history and to natural sciences like geology, physics, biology, et cetera. So certainly we could advance the, the argument of Hempel's making. And in fact, I found one paper, I can't remember the name of it, in which they talked about the, the rise of Hempel's doctrine. It's, it's, um, it's it's fading into the background and then it's it, it becoming popular again. So there are people who think that there's been a, a renaissance of 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 um, Hempel's kind of covering law or generally scientific approach to to historical explanation. I would suggest perhaps a more fruitful approach is to separate out to disentangle the the covering law model and this whole idea of, of explaining thing from the idea of explanation sketches, which I think is, is going to be very valuable. Uh, as I said earlier, there probably couldn't be a complete history, but certainly histories could be much more complete than they are. And we could be much more explicit about laying down what goes on. It doesn't really matter if it's a law of science or it's a generalization or it's a rule of thumb, but the more we can make these explicit, the more we can make history more like, a, more like a science and make our assumptions explicit, make our presuppositions ex explicit. And this is, I think, one of the best lessons we can take from Hempel is looking at our conventional history as, as explanation sketches and finding out all that we need to do to make a case for a historical explanation a little more complete than it has been done today, to date. So happy birthday, Carl Hempel, and thanks for listening.